This is Abe Freetanzer from CinemaDailyUS.com, and I'm very pleased to be speaking with the directors of Murder in Big Horn, uh, Rizal Benali and Matthew Galkin. How are you both doing today? Quite well. Thanks for having us. Of course. Um, can you tell me about whether it was difficult to get this show made in the first place? Um, no. No. It was not difficult to get this show made because we had an incredible partner in Showtime. Um, they actually brought me the idea of the series. Um, and uh, they, you know, they didn't know much about the issue. They were curious to know why women were disappearing and being murdered so prevalently in, in Native American um, communities. So uh, as a white man, um, I thought long and hard whether I was the right person to tell this story. Uh, and then ultimately I figured I could contribute. There's something I can contribute as far as helping to build a series that can reach a, a vast audience. That was that was my goal going in. I knew that I wanted a native filmmaking partner. Um, and ultimately that's uh, how Roselle and I started working together. Mm -hmm. And Rizal, what drew you to uh, be involved in this project? The topic matter itself is something that I've grown up with and that I've always known about being a Native girl. Um, even though I grew up off the reservation and life moved us around to several different places, my mom and I ended up in Rapid City, South Dakota, which is a border town with the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation where my family is from. Um, and so... It's just something that that you just know and grow up with inherently, you know, as as outlined in the in the whole doc series. But um, I never thought I would take on something like this because it is so large and complex and serious and 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 all of that stuff. But when the opportunity came forth, um, I actually found myself in a place feeling spiritually confident not only just as a person, but as a filmmaker. And uh, I knew that um, because this is such sensitive topic matter that it would require somebody to to be on that level. And I had the choice to step down or step up and and our ancestors and, and our elders always teach us that you, you should step up. And, and so uh, um, being that, I first, well, I should say this, I, I heard Matthew out and I could tell that his intentions were very clear and um, and it was going to be a true collaboration. Like I feel that I, I really felt like he saw me as a, and respected me as a, as a, um, as a, as a filmmaker and uh, a competent, capable filmmaker, I should say. And because our visions aligned with how we want to present the subject to the world, it just felt very natural to do this with him. And it worked out so well because if I were to do this alone, I already have a bias. I already have, I already want to do everything to ensure that the family's stories and truth were going to be put out there. I was still able to do that, but because my partnership with Matthew provided a whole different perspective, we were actually able to round out the series utilizing both of our backgrounds, which are very different. And so what you get is, um, is a series that is able to contextualize this large issue, not only for Native audiences, but specifically for non-Native audiences who may have never heard about this in their entire life. So that was the power of our collaboration. Absolutely. And I do think it's very interesting. There's a level of access, which is very strong here. Was it difficult to get Native people to feel comfortable speaking to the camera, knowing that they would be featured in this series? Well, the families um, who are in the series have already been advocating about this issue within the movement and not only that they've been very open with the stories because they want justice they want accountability so because or because of our intentions we're very clear about uh giving and elevating visibility of this issue and these stories it wasn't so much of an issue of uh whether they wanted to do it or not it was 
more or less of like, how do we do this in a way that is ethical and appropriate and doesn't cause any more trauma for the families? And because when we interview them, they are talking about, you know, they are talking about something that is very deep and sensitive. And it's like, we don't want to reopen these wounds and just leave them there. So we had to, so we had to discuss how to, to do this in a way that was, um, that was uh, least harmful for everyone involved. And on the note of context and perspective, I think it's also fascinating that you have participation from law enforcement and something that I've seen um, in another documentary that I saw at Sundance, Victim Suspect, is that the law enforcement professionals who tend to be okay being interviewed for this kind of uh, project are those who feel very strongly that they are doing the right thing, that they've done what they're supposed to do. And it was very jarring to hear you know, somebody say, I don't believe this murdered and missing indigenous women thing is is real. And that was very, very disturbing. Was that what was it like to to have that moment, you know, come across in here? Uh, well, in the inner I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't surprising during the interview that that was said, that was sort of the general tone of 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 the whole thing. Um, clearly the, uh, ex under sheriff had an ax to grind. He seemed to have an ax to grind, not only with the native community, but also the sheriff's office in general, which I think is maybe half the reason why he decided to sit for the interview. Um, he was, uh, he doesn't live in the state of Montana anymore. And so he was not fearful of the retribution, uh, that might come his way from the sheriff's office. Uh, you know, I I assume that that is a conversation that is pretty prevalent in the non-native communities in Montana, that sentiment. Um, uh, Roselle can certainly speak to that. Um, but yeah, it didn't seem like, it didn't, it seemed like a revelation to us, but to hit like to him and as a representative of a certain point of view, it just seemed like, you know, that's, that's, that's what is discussed behind closed doors, not even behind closed doors. Yeah. And all, all his perspective does is contextualize the biases that are, that make it difficult for families to get justice. You know, um, that point of view is, is, is is I would say is very well known like you know me as a brown native woman going into an area like that um there's a lot of micro uh microaggressions and there's discrimination that happens uh sometimes very blatantly sometimes not so and very sometimes very subtly so um it what you know it, it's just contextualization that's why we it was necessary you know, to to include those perspectives in a doc series like this. I honestly, you said that your you know the law enforcement represent representation was was strong here. We wish there was more. To be honest with you, we we you know we asked for over a year for a representative, a current representative of the sheriff's office to sit for an interview and discuss these cases because there's zero transparency in any of the work that they did in investigating any of these cases. And, you know, ultimately we made a series about a community and they're a big part of that community uh, for better or for worse. So we invited them to be part of this and they declined. I do think it's also interesting that, you know, you probe the fact that there are insular parts of the community that might also be responsible for some toxic elements. Was there any fear that that would, you know, cast Native communities in a bad light by sort of bringing that internal drama out this way? I will admit that it was a bold uh, decision to include that um, that that I that notion, right? I will say this: the history of why these issues exist is the complete root of of MMIW, um, and that may sound redundant. <laughs> The history of colonization directly affects not only indigenous peoples today, but it is um, it is it is a direct result of colonization. That's what MMIW is. And when we're talking about native on native violence, 
it was a bold decision to include that because it could cast a bad light on our people. However, um, I would say that native on native violence is also a direct result of colonization. And in this series, we talk about how there's traditional protocol um, before contact with settlers. If a crime was committed in those old days, we had a way of handling and dealing with perpetrators. And it was rare, but there was protocol and we took care of it. So we didn't have rampant crime like there is today. And when, um, when settlers started moving westward and violence came with that, boarding schools came with that, um, when you take away a, a people's language, their land and purpose, um, this is what you get. You get a lost peoples and you feel that with the things of today's society, whether it's uh, alcohol, uh, um, abuse, and not giving them the tools to uh, recover from trauma. This is what happens is you get native on native violence. So the history of what we included in the series contextualizes why we can talk about native on native violence. You know, we can talk about why this is now happening in our communities because before it did not happen, but now it is. And the big change, the big thing is colonization. Of course. I also um, at Sundance had the opportunity to see a film called Fancy Dance. Um, which deals a lot with some of similar subjects, but obviously it's a, a different narrative. Did you have a chance to see this film and what is it like to sort of be in, in company with that that project uh, at Sundance? Yeah, um, Erica Tremblay is actually a friend of mine. And uh, when we both heard that we we're going to be at Sundance, you know, we were both ecstatic, especially uh, more so on the fact that uh, we were coming into the festival with works that were dealing with um, this particular issue. And um, because her film was, you know, written by her and, and uh, Michiana, and it was directed by Erica, and it was uh, filmed on, you know, in Indian territory, and it starred actual Native peoples. Um, what you get is a narrative that's uh, more true to to what it is. But I was saying earlier that I could never do a narrative based uh, story around MMIW after having done this now, because I understand the realities uh, more so than I could have ever imagined prior. And um, what happens is we have a film like Fancy Dance and our series at a festival like Sundance, it works in tandem with one another and it creates a, it creates a, a more poignant representation of why this issue is so important and, and the urgency behind it. And um, <clears throat> there's a lot of non-narrative, uh, I, sh I should say, no, 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 let me recant. There's a lot of non-native um stories being told that are being centered around this issue so what i mean by that is there are uh, protagonists leading going into communities and and having to solve crimes of against native women and um those stories i know from what i know are not um are not native led and so when we're talking about representation and, and fiction-based stuff regarding MMIW, it's important that Native folks are involved with that so that there's a more ac accurate representation of such and a more sensitive approach as well. Of course, of course. Well, for more great conversations like this, you can subscribe to the Cinema Daily West YouTube channel. Make sure to check out Murder in Bighorn on Showtime. Thank you so both so much today uh, for taking some time to speak with me and uh, good luck with this project. Thank you. Thank you.